The easiest and most effective way for powerlifters to be more competitive is to change weight classes. For many, this can take a great powerlifter and make them elite. And this is the exact situation that Connor Lutz found himself in a couple years ago and changing weight classes was the move that catapulted his lifting career. This is why in today's video, we're gonna talk about weight cutting, giving you an inside look at what the best strength athletes in the world are doing to make weight, so you can apply it with your own clients and your nutrition coaching business. You have been competing internationally, but this was probably one of your big first splashes in the open category in 2016, and you did you did quite well. You had like a bench medal and a top five finish, maybe it was fourth. I think it was fifth. That was a big back and forth with Atwood at the time. We are kind of jockeying for that that gold medal before we get too far let's define some stuff weight cutting is the process of weight manipulation in the days leading up to a weight certification it is very common to see athletes compete in weight classes that are far below their day-to-day -day body weight athletes will train heavier and be bigger then manipulate their body weight through weight cutting to make the weight class this is important because with all else being equal, the more muscular athlete is the more competitive one. People kind of pushing me that 74 is probably the more appropriate weight class, just like the way I, you know, carried weight, my general frame and stuff like that. I competed at 83 for a while, but honestly, I never like truly filled out 83. I think I did one meet at 93 but it was like i did it to compete with a friend and i was like 84 kilos yeah. and like ate momentarily a buffet for breakfast that morning sort of yeah. thing to like be over 83 and even when i was competing like competitive at 83 at the competitive at the time i was like 81 kilos so i never really filled out the class in hindsight like if i was to go back up to 83 now i think i do have you know the tools and the wherewithal and whatever to like do it properly and get there and and probably be like similarly competitive ish but at the time I was just like you know the seafood diet sort of thing and I obviously wasn't eating what I needed to 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 actually be 83 so there's a, a couple kind of factors between kind of the injury I think part of it was the sport itself getting more competitive and just realizing that like you know being 81 kilos at like stuffing my face to be there probably isn't the most appropriate class to like truly be competitive. So then that kind of gave me the the motive to to come down. Connor makes this change to come down to the 74 kilo class and it instantly makes him more competitive, allowing him to go toe to toe with the best athletes in the world. This for Connor Lutz to take the lead. I stress with two lifters to go and Atwood is looking so strong today, Ryan. But let's focus on Lutz to move into the gold medal position. Connor looks pumped with up. With two lifters to follow. And only two and a half kilos between these three attempts. Look at that arch, that setup. Such a technical wizard when it comes to the bench press. Um, the man with the bench press arms. Oh, he's oh, moving, he's oh, moving. He's moving. Whoa. Whoa. Puts himself in the number one position. Two to one, he gets a blue. That's it, and he's one happy. of them saw downward movement. Changing weight classes was a total game changer for Connor. But doing this can be easier said than done, especially if you still want to lift well. Anyone can make a weight class, but getting there and being competitive and feeling strong is a totally different thing altogether. To do this, we need to fundamentally understand and know what influences our weight in the short term, but also what influences our weight in the long term. In the short term, which is hours and days, our body weight is influenced by how much water we carry as well as the food we carry. But in the long term, which is weeks and months, a change in our body weight is influenced by actual physical tissue, how much fat mass and muscle mass we are carrying. This means in the short term, we can adjust and manipulate our body weight by adjusting the fluid and the electrolytes we consume, as well as the weight and digestibility of our food. Compared to what happens in the long term, which is going to be gaining muscle or losing fat, this happens by adjusting our energy and macronutrient intake. Now you can't just know this, you need to be able to apply it as well, which is where Connor found himself before the switch to a lower weight class you knew what he needed to do but not really how to apply it so listen to this so from like a, a basic like scientific perspective like i had like the basic principles of of you know diet nutrition and, and that sort of thing but i was i was really missing the kind of application piece so at 83 i was you know conscious of what i was eating I, like i say seafood diet but really it was like you know I, I was conscious of what i was eating but it wasn't with purpose if that makes sense yeah you're eating um, healthy like you're eating healthy and making healthy choices as an athlete but it yeah. wasn't it just wasn't within what needed to happen to make changes with your tissue and performance and that kind yeah of thing. and there there wasn't enough consistency like objectively day to day so like 
you know, depending on what your food choice is one day versus the other, you could be eating, you know, to the point of what you would perceive to be a surplus, but it comes down to the numbers. You actually weren't in a, <laughs> in a surplus. And, yeah. and, uh, I, I would always start tracking where I was at, like tracking my, you know, food intake and stuff like that. And it, like, I'd get to like the two week mark kind of, and then just, or maybe I wouldn't quite get to like the two week mark and then just kind of like fall off. I never like stuck with it. And then, um, when I decided to go down to 74 and I started working with you and it was just having that accountability to actually do what I've already, like, I already started that process, but having that accountability to like, you know, actually do it and do it with purpose. It honestly didn't take me very long to get like for the application to match that, that the principles behind it, yeah. but having that push to actually adhere to the plan really just made it all kind of click for me. And then, and then you start to, then you can start to use the numbers, like you said, for a reason and manipulate one thing versus another and understand how you feel with this versus that or whatever. And, and I think probably like in hindsight, the number one, the, like the two major things, apart from just calories, not being consistent enough to like consistently in a surplus to get to 83. The, I think the major thing is, is I was probably more than likely on average below my necessary protein and probably getting too many calories from fat and not enough from carbs from like a performance perspective, which is kind of ironic just because you think if you're eating that much like fatty foods that you probably would get that surplus. But I think just me naturally being a smaller person, you'd have like a day of like, quote unquote, binging on fatty stuff. And then the next day I just feel like crap and I eat leaner and all of a sudden my calories are down and I'm just like net neutral again. <laughs> you know, like, yep. So yep. Um, I think that's probably what it was in hindsight. And then, so I can't remember how long we worked together for, it was quite a while. And then I kind of started just doing my my own thing based off of what, what we had done. And really like the approach never changed because it, it made sense to me. I understood why we were doing what we were doing and I felt good. And, and it was mm -hmm. really easy for me to, you know, take control of that for myself. Yep. So ever since then, ever since we started working together, apart from, you know, the odd time here and there where, you know, I, I wasn't as strict as I would be, I basically just carried on that process just in control of my own, you know, destiny. <laughs> when Connor and I started working together, he was able to accomplish two main things. Tracking his nutrition, specifically two macro targets for longer periods of time heading into meets. This would allow him to optimize his body composition so he could get leaner and perform better in training. A process that would happen over weeks and months to get him within striking range of the new weight class. And then heading into the competition, we'd make some short-term changes so that he could make weight. And this was focused mainly around water manipulation. Now there is some debate as to when you should actually make these changes. Should you diet right into the meat? This is what Connor and I discovered. There's a lot of different opinions on this as well, but one thing that I, I see come up a lot of times, and it's probably not so much in the IPF drug tested crowd, maybe it's outside of that, maybe it's in like different federations and stuff, is that you make these tissue changes and adjustments in your diet in an off season, as opposed to in competition. And our kind of philosophy and what we've done is almost like a bit more like a natural bodybuilder in terms of, uh, you know, when we control for the things that matter and we track volume and, you know, technique always improves. And like, we're always focusing on that stuff. Like we can get away with actually dieting into a contest and it going over pretty well. Like, how do you, how do you feel about that? And, you know, the way that I think works best for me and kind of how I've explained it to other people is, is I think it seems kind of like semantics, but I think it's important to differentiate between like dieting and cutting because I do think those are two different things when it comes to like the sake of a powerlifting competition. Mm -hmm. So kind of using my example where, you know, start your prep, if you will, at 80 kilos. And the goal would be to do like the last block of training at the weight that you want to cut into the competition from. So like, you know, let, let's, this is all just random, you know, made up numbers, but, or, you know, timelines or whatever, but say there's a 12 week, you know, cycle leading up into the competition. So you start that at 80 kilos, you train for the first eight weeks. And the objective is obviously to train, but throughout that time from, from a weight perspective would be to lose 80 kilos down to like, you know, 77 or whatever that target number is yeah. so that yeah. you do kind of the last, you know, your heavy peak program at the weight that you're hoping to get back to basically after the weigh in. So, I mean, it's a bit of like six, one half dozen of the other. So like you're, you're obviously, you're not just going to stop training when you diet, you know, so mm -hmm. there there's that the timelines of it. But what I wouldn't try and do personally is to go from like 80 to 77 with the target timeline for 77 being like a week out, you know, right. where you've done all your heavy training at like, you know, 79 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you still have to cut from 77 to 74. Right. 
work in my yeah. case, you know, so that, that's kind of how I've done it. And then this way, at least if you do have to, you know, make some adjustments where things not coming off, things aren't coming off as quickly as you like or whatever, at least you can make those more drastic changes in your diet earlier out where you have that time to kind of like, you know, get back to some, you know, normalcy yeah. or like consistency in that, that last little bit, where at least maybe that last bit of training goes poorly just because you, you lost a bunch of weight, but mm -hmm. at least going into the competition, you're going to be successful because you have a realistic expectation of where you're right. at. Here's the really important part. For most lifters, Connor included, we must figure out the comfort level from where they can cut from. It's important to know where you sit regularly above your weight class. Is it 1% above your weight class, 3% above your weight class, or like Connor, 5% above your weight class? From there, how much weight you'll have to cut and what methods you'll actually use will have differing impacts on performance depending on the individual athlete. Now, this isn't what most weightlifting resources suggested at the time, mainly because they lacked context. Let me explain. The one thing I was gonna ask you is that as I started writing about this in like 2017, I was one of the kind of, I, I feel like I was one of the first people to outline like, if you're one or 2% above the weight class, you don't need to be doing the same things that someone that is 6% above, but a lot of the powerlifting resources at the time were more or less like, here's the kitchen sink of things you could yeah. do without really context around when, like what or why you should do. So people would come in, you know, three kilos lighter than they need to and cut for the sake of well, cutting. Yeah, and, and that, that's what I found where I've kind of found that range where I feel very comfortable making weight. Like it's not a stressor. It's not mm -hmm. difficult. It's just like part of the process for me yeah. now. And if I, if, if I do my training lighter than that range, that's exactly what happens. You end up like making weight a day out or whatever. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, that's not helpful, right? Like yeah. when you've intentionally trained heavier than the weight class, it's not helpful to now make weight like a day before and mm -hmm. be lighter for more time. Like that doesn't, that's not an advantage in any way, right? You just feel depleted for longer and you're less yeah. likely to get that back when it comes time to, to compete. So I think it is important to kind of like take a couple shots at it and like train lighter, see how it goes, train heavier, see how it yeah. goes and, and understand like what it takes to make it heavier, what it takes to make it lighter and find that range for, for each yeah like for you or your athlete or whatever, and then just build that into the process. And you, then it becomes a lot more calculated. You have, again, it's like one less variable that you have to account for on the meet day, because yeah. you know, you know, squats are going to kind of feel a bit worse than training, but like, you know, our expectations, our range of outcomes is accounting for that, right? Because it's now consistent. If you're all over the place and the objective is just to make weight and how you got there is different every time you have no idea. Like, so you made weight. That's not the same as making weight the last time. If you had to cut five kilos a time before and you cut exactly. one this time, like yeah. as far as I know, I was one of the first nutrition and powerlifting coaches to suggest that depending on where you sat in relation to your weight class, you should use different cutting strategies to maximize performance. Most previous articles and resources outlined all the variables and all the things you could do to make weight without any real context for why why and how much depending on the individual athlete. In 2017, I published a book called The Way of the Weigh-In, and here's what I suggested after helping hundreds of athletes through this process. Number one, if you have to do a minimal cut, meaning that you're one to 2% above the weight class, there isn't much you have to do until around one to two days before the actual weight certification. Going low residue with your food choices, which means limiting fiber and vegetable intake, and limiting sodium 36 to 48 hours before the actual weigh-in, allows most athletes to drop one to 2% of their body weight relatively easily. Now, if you're around 3% above the weight class, you're gonna to need to use a more moderate strategy, which means everything I just outlined in the minimal approach plus, which means some form of water loading and water restriction, ramping up your water intake for about five days before the actual weigh-in, and then seizing water intake around 12 hours before you actually weigh in. One day before the meet, the athlete will be consuming low volume foods and decreasing total energy intake for that day by around 25 to 50%, or at least shifting it earlier. Sometimes a natural diuretic like dandelion root can be helpful as well. Now, if you're around 5% body weight and above the weight class, you're gonna to have to do something more drastic. You're typically gonna to have to do the moderate approach plus the whole kitchen sink of other variables. In some cases, this means for sweating and spitting and eating low carb heading into the meat. When we put all of these strategies together, it actually looks like this, as well as how long they stay dehydrated will impact their performance as well. So you need to know where you sit above the weight class so you can pick the appropriate approach. So as you've seen with Connor, he didn't have to do much outside of water and sodium manipulation to drop from 77 or 78 
78 kilos to 74 kilograms, which is around four to 5% of his body weight. He wouldn't go the low residue approach because he actually preferred eating a higher volume of food. This worked really well for him, but some of it could have been mental because there's a large psychological component of this. And let's talk about that. You feel like some of those bigger, those bigger cuts, is that, is that something in terms of just, is it mental fortitude? Is it kind of like this Rocky mentality that like, Hey, I feel okay. This is okay. I can do it. This is what I've signed up for kind of thing. Or what, what do you think plays into that? I, I think for me personally, it is that like, I I'm kind of one of those people that like embrace the grind, if uh -huh. you will, yeah. like, you yeah. know, it is kind of like motivating in some ways to like, to have that, um, I don't know, to, to have that as something to overcome compete or whatever. This is what you or your clients need to understand if they want to cut weight for powerlifting competitions, because there's a lot that can go wrong if we focus on the wrong variables or do too much. In summary here, we change our body tissue in the long term through adjusting energy balance and macronutrient intake. We can lose or gain a lot of weight in this way, but it takes longer periods of time. And this is what helps you approach a weight class. But to make the weight class, you can cut weight to get into it. You can do this by adjusting the weight of your food and the sodium and water you're consuming. If you have a lot of weight to cut, you can use sweating and spitting and low carb to actually make the weight class. Doing these strategies, you can lose one, three, even 5% of your body weight to make weight. And that's how you make weight and cut weight for powerlifting competitions. One thing I am gonna follow up next in a future video is what now, what do you do now that you've made weight? This is important for many reasons, mainly because I once saw an athlete eating a charcuterie reward during a squat warm up, so I'm gonna need to explain this. Actually, just so I'm not irresponsible, you wanna start with fluids first, including some carbs and salt, and then you wanna prioritize carb-containing foods. Your normal choices that you could tolerate in large amounts without eating too much fat because it slows down digestion and protein just isn't important on a day like this. Now, as great as all those tips are, if you're really serious about starting a nutrition coaching business, the next thing I'll have you do is check out this video I've linked up right here. Now that you know how to help athletes cut weight for competition, learn how to plan and periodize their plans for long-term success. So make sure to check it out now and I'll see you in the next video.